Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined by Robin Spinks today. Robin is the Senior Innovation and Relationships Manager for RNIB. I've um, known Robin for a, quite some time now and Robin's also uh, a member of the Diversity Board for the Institute of Coding alongside myself. So um, it's great to have you with us, Robin. Can you tell us a little bit more about A, yourself and, and B, the work that you're doing for the RNIB because it sounds like a really interesting role that a lot of our audience have been very keen to know more about. Great, well thank you for having me, it's good to be here. I've been working in the disability sector for nearly 20 years actually, which is quite astounding, it goes by very quickly. I started my career in um, the employment arena, so supporting disabled people uh, gaining and retaining employment and also doing a lot of support uh, for employers, enabling them to to be more positive towards disability in the workplace. And that I spent about five or six years doing that and then went on to work in international development for a few years, for about four years overseas. Um, and that led me very much into the assistive technology area where my current role um, is focused. So I work with technology companies primarily to get them to build in accessibility and to think about the whole ecosystem of products and services, hardware, software services that disabled people might use and think about that becoming, you know, a much more inclusive proposition. So that's that's a kind of very top line overview that involves delivering training, doing consultancy, quite often influencing and negotiating and trying to find the right opportunities to get in to create examples of you know a shift in accessibility so it might be with a television manufacturer could be with an app developer or you know company that's responsible for a website it might even just be that it's with a major online service that people use and where we're really concerned to try and bring about greater accessibility. So yeah, really broad based uh, role. I've just come back this afternoon from Luxembourg, um, where I've been with the people who are, are working on um, kind of voice first devices. That's been a really interesting past couple of days. Um, so yeah, it's busy and there's never a dull moment. No, 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 I, I agree. I think that um, actually, Working in, in assistive tech is such a really wide and varied role that you're never going to get bored. It's no, no two days are the same. And I wonder whether that's partly because of having a personal connection. So I've been partially sighted all my life. I often wonder whether that makes us more um, interested or more likely to work in this industry than just you know being passionate about it. It's a tricky question, I know, but it's one that was on my mind the other day. Um, and I, I do often wonder about this, whether if you've got some personal experience of disability, maybe it just kind of, maybe it charges you up in a different way. I don't know. What do you think? I think we've, we've got some vested self-interest in making sure that the technology and the ecosystems <laughs> work for us and people like us, for sure. But But equally, I think... It, it genuinely is a fascinating area and, and, and we get to look at, we get to do sort of the market scanning, looking at what's coming, you know, we're, we're always looking for, and this is the glass half full approach to technology, is looking for things that you can apply it for that are going to be useful for for people and for society and so on. So yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, Mm. It is one of those things where it's like, oh, well, I'm going to look at this today, I'm going to look at that today, and maybe I'm not a complete finisher. Um, <laughs> <you know, because laughs> I'm too busy looking at new stuff, but um, but I yeah. do think that it's, um, yeah, absolutely driven by by some personal connection to it. But, but I think that when I talk to some of the people that are working in the field with me and that are working uh you know at atos that we've brought on as apprentices and so on they've not got any um direct experience of disability necessarily but i think they find it interesting and i think that they're finding that, yeah. that, that they've got a, a, a 
a re rewarding career in an area of tech that they never imagined they would end up in, probably because they never knew that yeah. it existed. Yeah, I think it's like that for a lot of people, isn't it? It's not an obvious niche of computing mm -hmm. that you might choose to go into unless you knew something about it previously or you had a reason to be interested, like a personal experience or family member or you know some other experience that brings you into contact with accessibility. Um, but it's fascinating. It's constantly changing, and you know, it, I think how it is today is going to be very, very different in the next six months. Yep, I think there's always new stuff going on. Uh, I think it's very interesting in that um, this brings us on to the the stuff with the Institute of Coding. We're both uh, mm -hmm. participating in this try, um, and the Institute of Coding, for those that don't know, is a uh, it's a collaboration between uh, government and industry and the universities and industry. So it's part government funded and part uh, industry funded to aim to, to teach digital skills to people and bring more people in uh, to learn the digital skills that the UK needs. Uh, and, and obviously one of the things that we're hoping to, to be an outcome of this and working towards is that accessibility gets taught as part of the tech degree. So as they're creating new technology degrees and new qualifications, that it becomes embedded in the pedagogy, pedagogy, which means that hopefully as we get generations coming through universities, you're going to end up with uh, more people actually knowing about it and knowing that it exists and be start to the output of coding qualifications and so on is inclusive products and services and that, that that becomes normal like it's normal to think about security now and I know Antonio will probably want to follow up after this so I'll I'll be quiet no uh, Mabel is you no know, consider considering that you no know, that you are trying to go into the direction of uh, of education but there's a, there's a lot to do today to remove accessibility from the niche where it is so is the Institute of Code working in ways where you can organize meetups with developers, people that are actually already uh, that are working in the re industry today, in order to okay, you need to look at this as well, and we can provide you the tools and the the ways of you can upskill yourself and improving your code and making it, uh, accessible to everyone. So so yes and and, and yes. Um, in that there's, there's, um, there's their first conference taking place in, in March uh, and there are lots of universities engaged in that and, and lots of businesses so uh, you can find out you know, more about that on, on, the, uh, you know, on the Institute of Coding website and from their Twitter feed which I think is I, I will check but IO coding um, but that's not the main part of Robin's or my job yeah. So, but it but it fits in with your job, right, Robin? Your you know it's part of absolutely. that building relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things, whoever we're talking to in a tech company, whatever we're talking them, to them about, there's one thing that's absolutely always consistent, and that is the need to get more disabled people into coding and computer science. That's absolutely unequivocal, everyone agrees on it, and we all know that it's a priority, it's a difficult thing to do. So there are lots of small incremental steps that actually contribute to that happening. And the IOC work that, that Neil and I are involved in, that would definitely be one element. Just a couple of weeks ago, we did some work, or we announced some work we'd done with, with Apple, which was around opening up access to swift playgrounds so that children can learn, visually impaired children can learn how to use swift playgrounds and, and learn coding from an early age. So there's another element of that strategy. There's also been a project that we've been very involved in with Microsoft, the Turino project, which is around enabling kids to learn to code using simple physical tactile blocks that are coloured and different textured. So. You know, for us, it's a whole raft of measures that effectively come together, and, and, and each part of those, you know, that each of those measures effectively does one little bit to contribute towards that. So I tend to think of it as almost like a macro level goal. It's a big goal that 
you can't do through one series of activities. But I think the great thing about Institute of Coding is it's given a real focus to that, that work and to the, the urgency of that task. So the more that we can hang things off that, as it were, as a structure, so be that events or you know meetups, the kind of thing you're suggesting, Antonio, um, we'd love to do that. And we'd love to collaborate with other people who are keen to do it and just really create a vibrant culture around coding and computer science. And, and you know, part of that's also about making sure that disabled people with different kinds of disability feature in all of the, the material that we produce, the events that we deliver, um, the conference that's coming up. So we're really looking forward to, you know, a, a greater celebration of accessibility in all of that work um, and, and also in the work of partners who contribute to it, so tech companies. The lovely thing here, I think, is that in many ways we're pushing against an open door. People recognise it's a big challenge, but everybody wants to do it to some level. So I think it's a really exciting time to be involved. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think it, it's really definitely something that there's so many large and important organisations involved and there's such goodwill for this that it's an opportunity that we really can't afford to to, to miss out on. Um, and, and, and certainly, hopefully, over the longer term as well, what, what will happen is um, we, we know at the moment that, that uh, universities teach in certain ways. Uh, if we're to attract different kinds of people to tech education, then we also need to be changing the way we teach, changing the way that we yeah. attract. Because there needs to be that kind of, like we've already experienced to a certain extent with um, flexible working, we need, flex we need much more flexible learning as well. Yeah. It's a bit of a chicken and egg, isn't it? Because part of it is we create the tools and the approaches and make them mm -hmm. attractive, but then also get the institutions on board to make sure that they're challenging, you know, any kind of preconception that there is about having a career in coding or computing and, and letting kids with disabilities see, this is for me. There's someone like me on that course. I'm going to be the next person who does that. And just giving them that incentive and that sense of, optimism and encouragement that actually enables them to want to go forward and, and actively pursue that kind of career? Yeah. I, I think that uh, uh, there was a, a few years ago here in Cork City, they started a movement called Cork Coder Dojos. Okay. Yeah, uh, they, started, they started here in, in, the, in, in, in Cork and there's now almost every school organized a, a Coder Dojo. And I think that you know events like this that involve children are also a way to involve children with different abilities in the same space as, as yeah. a kind of a as a, a, a kind of a inclusion space where people kids are able to learn about each other's needs. So there's an element that is social education, but there's also an element of a teaching code. So if you are able to embed you know accessibility into those spaces. I think it, it's you are opening a very interesting window of possibilities. Yeah, and you know, as a consumer and as a user of products, think about the experience. Fast forwarding, you know, three or four years, and think about being able to use more and more products where disability and accessibility have been infused into the product design. That's a really exciting prospect. I know right now, if you pick up a product that's had really good input from disabled users, you can see it, you can feel it, you know, you could experience it in so many ways. The prospect of having a lot more of that inside design and inside final product iteration, particularly in software, I would say, I think that's a super exciting prospect and an amazing goal to shoot for. So it's really exciting. No, especially if, if you look things from a, a, a perspective of customer experience, where all organisations are, are investing, no. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I, I was just thinking back to one of our former guests, and we had uh, Pixel on from from Dusseldorf, 
and they're they're a, a really interesting outfit where they're, it's a partly a community scheme uh, where people with learning disabilities teach other people in the community tech skills, but they also do product testing. Yeah, and and the feedback from the 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 teams that take their products, you know, the products that they're developing to Pixel to be tested by people with learning disabilities is that the input is so valuable and the products are so much better as a result of having had this mm -hmm. input that, that, that you know, it's, it's, it's extremely valuable work that they're doing. And, and absolutely, I, I see a world where we've maybe you know, the other glass half full people have gone, oh, this is great new tech, let's add lots and lots of new things. Mm -hmm. uh, when actually what you want is to make something useful for people. So so it's it's about making it intuitive, making sure that people can actually use your product, not that it has the feature. Because there's yeah. no point having a feature if you can't find it or you don't know how to use it. And, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about what the purpose is of, of the thing that you're trying to do and trying to make. Uh, I saw a great video today, which was um, shared by our network, which was, a, you know, the Access short movie. Um, I think it was Corey Cooper was featured in it. I'm mm -hmm. going to be slapped for being getting the name wrong, but essentially he was talking about you know, all of the stuff built into into iOS and how he navigates around using Blind Square and everything. Else. Those features have been built in over time, like you said, um, but they're you know yeah. they're they're in part of the ecosystem now, and they they you know, they've, they've changed the the way that they're thinking about design. Microsoft have started you know have changed their culture over the last few years. It's been really interesting to watch the the cultural shift that's gone on within that organization developing products where they've gone from you know it, it being on the periphery to now being much more deeply embedded in their ways of thinking and some of that is down to leadership of course yeah. it is i came across a few days ago a letter that i wrote i drafted uh to the previous ceo of microsoft and um our previous chairman, Mr. Kevin Carey, signed it, and the letter went off to uh, Steve Ballmer. And I was reading the letter. It was written, I think, in 2010. Yeah. And just the amount of positive things that have happened since then, and it's about exactly what you've said, Neil. It's about a leadership change. You know, a new CEO at Microsoft, and also, I would argue, you know, a recognition that a lot of the concerns we raised with them as an organization, they took on board and admitted that things weren't as good as they could be. And they've, they've made incredible progress in a short space of time. You know, there is still a hell of a lot to do, but, you know, it is actually really good to see organizations just turning the corner like that. I think, I think Jenny Lee Flurry has been a really positive force in her team. Um, and just just taught the organisation quite a few lessons about inclusion and accessibility, and that's a that's a brilliant place to start. So I think we need to see more organisations doing that, um, and really just kind of carving out that that positive niche around inclusion, and then getting work programmes going around it. Um, so they've demonstrated what what you can do when you make a leadership change, and you you make a commitment to actually you know, working on stuff and, and, and turning out stuff that customers can use as well. That's the important bit, you know. People are now getting products that are making a difference, that are easier to use. Um, there's still a lot to do, but I think they've traveled a long way in a short period of time. Yeah, and I, I, I think so. There's, there's, there's a lot of stuff that, that we can see in progress. Um, there's definitely still more to do on, on usability across pretty much the whole of the tech industry. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I saw a great rant from Mr. Alan Cooper, who's one of the guys that, you know, he, he's the guy that invented personas. Um, mm. And he was, he was ranting about how as a, you know, as an industry, you know, we've almost, it's almost sold out. Uh, so it was kind of it was it was kind of an interesting 
rant about how we, you know we're not doing usability or UX well. Um, hopefully, you know that's turning a corner. I, we, I think you know being led by some of these companies that, that there will be a, uh, there will be a sea change because actually the complexity of stuff now is is such that they have to start boiling it back down again. Yeah. And here's another thing. I think the kind of rapid march forward of voice first computing. So let's think about smart speakers first of all. <laughs> but you know, voice first as a as a medium, I think that's also heightened awareness among consumers generally about the issue of complexity. So I hear a lot more people talking about how they find web pages quite difficult and quite challenging compared yeah. to using a voice first interface. And I think the more that you use voice first, the more that you become cognizant of that fact and you're more appreciative of the, the complexity. And you know, just to, to kind of use a personal anecdote of it, I've got a I've got a Google Pixel phone, which if I take it out of my pocket and I squeeze the phone and then say walking directions to X place that I need to get to. Um, and I then say start navigation, it just does it all for me. It does all of it and voices it for me. And I haven't had to do any poking around, finding an app, poking around the search bar. So I think, you know, anything that kind of removes that complexity, people love it. And once they get to know what it can offer, you know, that, that then makes them reflect differently on some of the more traditional interfaces. So when you start thinking about, right, I'm going to go back to a website to have a look at how to do this, gosh, it seems like there's a heck of a lot going on in there compared to that voice first interface. So I don't know, maybe people, maybe consumers generally are becoming more um, partial to voice first and simplicity mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, and, and kind of craving a world where we don't have quite so complex web interfaces. I, I'm sure, I'm sure they are. I think there's there's a couple of points I'd like to pick up on. First off, observation. Um, if if I get asked by my wife, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? And I have to scroll <laughs> across to an app, wait for the app to load, and yeah. then it refreshes. Uh, yeah. What interests me is that if I, if I actually ask Siri, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow in yeah. wherever I live? It's almost instantaneous. It's like it's be, it's not only have I shortcutted all of the stuff about having to navigate the interfaces, but it's almost like it's shortcut through the, yeah. the calls and gone direct out onto the internet. So something else is happening yeah. faster too. Um, yeah. On the other hand, we haven't dealt yet with complexity of choice. So so yeah. use, use so voice interfaces are fantastic for stuff that you know what to do, right? So they're, they're, they're great when you want to tell a computer to do something for you. Where I think we've still got a long way to go and, and haven't resolved yet is where we're asking a computer or we don't know what it is yes. exactly that we want. Because then, you know, we've we've got to think about natural language. Can the computer understand ambiguity? Yes. And can we hold, you know, 20 different options in our brain as it reels through them? I don't know about you, but I, I'm i yeah. rubbish at, at, you know, list, you're on a phone menu system, and by the time oh. I've got the third or fourth one, I've forgotten which one it is yes. meant to press. Oh, no, so absolutely. I press zero for the operator. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, do you know what? It's so interesting because it's really interesting you say this because I was looking at, once again, I was looking at the demo of Google Duplex the other day. And I was actually thinking, I wonder, I wonder whether we're actually approaching a stage where people's acceptability of AI as a substitute for humans is actually, it's actually changing quite fast. And, and people, if people would accept Google Duplex, so this notion of a bot being able to take your request and go off and action it for you, if they are happy to have that, at the same time, does that also mean that in terms of certain things like restaurant choice, people are maybe a little bit less fussy? So, for example, 
does it, does it matter most that the restaurant is within two miles of where each of the diners are based and that it has a minimum of 4.4 stars? Is that the real thing that matters? Or do people want to trail through lots of menus and lots of different info about restaurants? I, I really wonder that. I wonder whether people might just be content with saying, right, it's got to have a minimum of four stars, it needs to be less than two miles away, and everybody has to be able to get to it, and it just needs to be booked. Do you know, are we, are we moving towards a society where people are less particular about choice because it's ultimately driven by convenience? So you know in outline parameters what it is you want. You know you want an Italian restaurant. You know it's got to be a good one, and you know it has to be easy to get to. But is that is that kind of technology going to constrain our ability to be creative and have choice? And will we want to actually sift through lots of options? Well, I think that's it. I think you've hit the nail on the head. We actually uh, quite often suffer information paralysis because we have so much choice that it becomes almost impossible to make a decision and I've yes. done and, 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 and restaurants was a great one because every time I go on holiday I end up sort of hitting myself because I'm sat in a hotel room scrolling through the internet looking at restaurant reviews rather than just going out and finding somewhere to eat yeah, maybe there's just too much choice. Yeah, and I think I'm probably similar. If I want to go to a Thai restaurant, I actually don't want to look at any more than a maximum of three options. Otherwise, I've sort of forgotten which one it was that did whatever, and I've got to go back, yeah. and then it becomes tedious. So I yeah. wonder whether you know. I wonder whether if we were able to say to a bot, find me a Thai restaurant, minimum of four stars, eight o'clock for four people. You know, is is that ultimately is it that packaged convenience that's ultimately going to be more contract yeah. more attractive to people than extensive choice? I think it could be. I think I think yeah, I think I think it could be because I think that that we have so much choice that 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 we don't actually necessarily make the best choices because we're not actually capable of sifting through all of that information in the same way that a that a, a, a computer would. Now, what we might also want to do is say, find me a Thai restaurant uh, that it's four star reviews, no paid reviews. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, because <laughs> that's the other thing that is skewing the results at the moment. You get yeah. you get a lot of people, you know, you, you know what you're seeing. And we see this on Amazon a lot. You know, all of the yeah. reviews are skewed towards being brilliant. Yes. You know? So, yes. Um, you know, learning from what my wife's taught me. I always go and look at the rubbish reviews because they're at least. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a little bit like Uber, isn't it? I mean, on Uber, yeah. so many, there's so much pressure for people yeah. to get a five star rating that you do sometimes use the service and think, look, actually, do you know, is that genuinely a five star rating or, you know, is there too much pressure for people to actually apply kindness? and leverage the ratings upwards. So I think ratings are a really interesting system for, for all sorts of things, for restaurants, for, yeah. for transport, etc., for anything really, because, you know, the customers and society's expectation around ratings feels like it's continuing to go up and it can yes. only go up so far because there are so, only so many ratings. Yes. Uh, I think that, yeah, go on. But that sometimes we need to somehow balance that you know in that particular case the use of technology why not just asking a local person you know what is the best restaurant near you why not yeah. why, we, why i need to go to the device because i think we need to also to find uh that that, that balance considering sometimes all the web is polluted because the ratings and this emergence to for search engine optimization is also bringing a lot of this polluted data yeah. to the rankings and yes. you end up having them on the on the on the voice systems as well. Even more difficult to distinguish how good they are, you know, because you don't really have a way. You just get an answer. You are not able to see deep yeah. into that answer. Yeah. yeah. But don't yeah. ask the concierge at the hotel because he's on the backhander from the local restaurant. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> I did do that the other week in Brick Plain. I actually wanted an Indian restaurant, and I said to the person on the door of the hotel, could yeah. he tell me where there was a good Indian restaurant? And he said, please get into that car. Get into my car. I'm driving you there, and I'll also pick you up and drive you back. This is before he'd even told me what it was. So, yeah, uh, you do. That, that practice goes on a lot. It actually yeah. turned out to be quite good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I did that once, and I had some pretty minging pig's trotters for dinner. Oh, yeah. dear. I tried oh, them. Not <laughs> no. I, I, you're braver than I am, I have to say. I wouldn't, it's not something I would... I went as far as having pigeon, and... Um, yeah, I think I, I think that that's that's not not good. Yeah. Robin, but now moving to, to today's technology and trends, what are the things that most excited you as something that can really make a, a difference? In you know, we have so many things, you know, from IoT, blockchain, so many things around, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality. What that are the things that are you are really paying attention and see a lot of potential? Well, I think I am super excited about uh, Google Duplex, I have to be honest. And, you know, the first iteration of that that customers will see is the call screening service that Google have made available on their most recent Pixel phone. Sadly, it's not available here in the UK just yet. But when you see this in action, this really feels like a step forward. So, you know, I'm ringing Neil. He's got one of these phones. I'm ringing him. He doesn't just get the option to accept or decline my call. He gets a third option, which is to screen it. Now, he's really busy. He's got lots of appointments. And although he enjoys chatting to me normally, he might not have time to chat to me. So you might want to know what's it about. So he can basically screen the call. And Google Duplex will say, hi, I'm sorry Neil's not available right now. But can you tell me who's calling and what your call is regarding? So I say, it's Robin here, and I'm calling about the next Institute of Coding meeting. And on the display of Neil's device, without him having to pick up the phone, he can see text, which is a transcript of that conversation. So he can see Robin's on the phone. He wants to chat to you about the Institute of Coding. Now, Neil could just decide, right, that's not important. I'm declining that. That's OK. I'll talk to him later. Or yeah. actually, I've been trying to get a hold of him. I do want to speak to him. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. I think that will really deal a blow to scammers who are calling people on their phones. I think it will really help them to sort out that problem. But it will also have a lot of productivity benefits. So I'm excited about that. I'm all over you know, the Internet of Things and smart home. I, I just love that stuff. In fact, I'm slightly obsessed with it. So we're the latest, the latest um, device to come into the house is a Neato vacuum cleaner, which is a robot vacuum cleaner. And I'm just astounded by it in terms of what it's able to do versus what a human can do with a vacuum cleaner. Because for a start, the size of the thing enables it to go straight under beds. So it goes right under all the beds. It goes under furniture of any kind, furniture that might have legs. So it actually picks up a whole lot more dust than traditional vacuum cleaners, than any of them would do. And it can do it while you're out at work. And you can watch on your phone its progress around the house. It'll tell you if it's going back to get some charge. It'll also even say things like, I'm feeling full, which means you need to go and empty the little dust cart from it and um, relieve it of its cargo. So it's just phenomenal. You know, I think a few years ago, this was kind of very, very uh, sort of sci-fi stuff. Now it's becoming commonplace in people's homes. So, you know, the more that we've got devices like that, the more that we're using smart lighting, smart heating, uh, it just makes life easier. So, yeah, I think I'm really excited about that. Um, autonomous cars, I was lucky enough last year to take about a seven mile trip around Mountain View in California in, um, in a driverless car. And that I have to say that was quite a moment for me because I think up until that point, I'd read lots, I'd listened to lots at seminars, and I'd had my own thoughts about whether something was becoming real. And that experience just demonstrated firsthand to me that this is real. And actually, if you've got a disability that means you can't drive, this is going to mean 
a huge transformation for you in time. You know, it's not going to happen overnight, but you're going to have so much more freedom and mobility to go places spontaneously. You know, that's the big, that's the kind of key word from an accessibility point of view that I always think is underplayed is spontaneity. Do you know, it's all about that. If you, if you're a driver and you have a driving license in a car, you can just jump in your car and go for a drive. You know, my parents used to do that sort of thing a lot when we were kids. And I thought it was wonderful. We just see where we ended up going. You know, so yes, you can get someone to take you in a cab or an Uber or give you a lift or whatever, um, you know, if you have a disability, but you can't do that spontaneity bit. So I'm really looking forward to that at a point in the future. Um, so there's a few things. Uh, 5G I'll throw into the mix. I've been to some 5G demos quite recently. I'm really excited about how that might, first of all, transform home broadband. Because I think that's where it's going to have the biggest impact. And then you start to think about its usefulness out and about for a whole host of services, health services, emergency services, just even using mobile, it's going to change pretty rapidly. So yeah, massive amount keeping me awake at night. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I, I think we're all looking forward to the, the gigabit speeds of, of 5, 5G for sure. Um, um, yeah. I, I sit here and, and although I've got fiber, um, which is not bad considering I'm in the countryside, uh, quite often I can, even on 4G, get um, you know, more bandwidth on mobile than I can yeah. through fiber. So, so 5G is really going to change how people are consuming data yeah. and, and certainly has the potential to get to the areas of the country where we haven't really hit because there's lots of patchy um, coverage for high speed internet in, in the UK and without high speed internet then you can't access the, the the technology and the services and a lot of the assistive tech is powered by stuff in the cloud yeah. um, so you're, you're not getting the benefits if you don't have the connectivity so I think it will be a game changer. Um, I think we're at the end of our time. It's been fascinating, wide ranging, and making me hungry at the same time. Need to thank <laughs> um, uh, you know, our supporters, Barclays, and also my ClearText for making sure that we keep the lights on and get our captions done and, and in good order. So thank you very much, Robin. We look forward to you joining us on Twitter. Thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you for for AXS chat, really enjoy the sessions and um, looking forward to, to taking part in future ones. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.